So Merry Christmas. <laughs> um, for the, for the newcomers, my name is Kevin Ha. I'm the lead pastor here at New City Church. I want to welcome you. You know, um, Christmas is an interesting time of the year. We, we feel a lot. We have a lot of memories built into Christmas. You know, my favorite Christmas was 19, Christmas of 1993. Let's put it this way. It's the most memorable Christmas. So right before Christmas during Thanksgiving, Grace and I were dating. And, um, you know, I wanted to marry her, but she didn't really say she wanted to marry me. Uh, she didn't come to her senses yet. Um, but she invited me to Thanksgiving at Minnesota. Her, that's where parents live. So I traveled to Minnesota and stayed with her for Thanksgiving, and it was beautiful. It's white, you know, just like another world. And we had a wonderful time there, got to meet her family. And then um, came back to L.A. I lived in downtown at the time. And, um, and, and, and you know, we, we talked on the phone every day for hours. This is before the uh, on, you know, unlimited phone plans. So I was paying you know, hundreds of dollars a month and, uh, on phone bills alone. And, and we were talking. And one day... <laughs> Um, and every time we talk, by the way, at the, sometime during the conversation, I would ask her to marry me. And, uh, and she would say something like, maybe, or thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, we had a great conversation. This was right before Christmas. Uh, we had a conversation, and she said, um, so uh, aren't you going to ask me the question that you always ask me? And uh, I said, what, uh, how are you? Uh, no, she said, no, no, the other question. And I said, will you marry me? And she says, yeah, that's the question. And I said, will you marry me? And she said, yes. <laughs> yes. And so that Christmas became very special. <laughs> It happened before Christmas, and we got married the next year. So, um, and I, I couldn't wait to tell people uh, that, you know, we're getting married, you know. And, and uh, I remember that Christmas was telling the good news of Grace marrying me. And today, though, I want to share the good news of Christmas, not about Grace, but about good news of Christmas. And so when, Ando, when the angel showed up to the shepherds in the field, they were terrified, right? Every time an angel shows up, it's not little baby angels with wings. They're, people are absolutely terrified. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, it says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah the Lord. I want to ask by asking this question, why is the birth of Jesus Christ good news of great joy? Good news of great joy. Good news is the same word for the word gospel. When we say gospel, it just means good news. And why is Christmas the gospel of great joy? That's what he says right here, right? Hey, good news, by the way, it's, it, it's something that declared to us, something that happened. It's not like something that you should do. It's, it's something that's happened or happened to you or something that is declared, not something that, is, that calls you to do. So it's not about you, really. It, it's, it's about something that happened. To answer this question, let's go to 1 John chapter 4. Verse 9 to 12. First John chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. Not a usual Christmas passage, but it's really about Christmas. John, first John 4, 9 to 12. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. 
In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Take a look at the first part of that passage. It says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world. So what is the good news of Christmas? It's that God's love was revealed to us among us. It's the good news of God's love for us. We get to find out how much God loves us. Christmas, the good news of Christmas is that... Hey, look, everybody, God loves you. That's the good news. God loves you. It's the simple news of God's love for each and every one of us. So what I want to do is ponder, just kind of chew on this simple message of God's love by looking at three things from this passage. So... Number one, that God values us. Number two, God takes pleasure in us. And number three, that God wants us to love one another. Okay, so let's go to the first point, that God values us. So this passage, remember, said God's love was revealed in Christmas, right? And the word for love here is this word, I'm sure you've all heard it, word agape, It's usually defined as self-sacrificial, unconditional love. But you know, today, I I, I wanna look at a fullness of that definition, a little bit more, how that word was more, uh, was conventionally used. In this context, it talks about self-sacrificing, unconditional love, because that's the love of God for us. But there, there's, there's more to agape than that. So I looked up the Greek-English lexicon, um, the one that's used by most scholars, and it's, it defines agape as this, to have love for someone or something based on sincere appreciation and high regard, to love, to regard with affection, loving concern, love, it's interesting how, you know, dictionaries def, uh, define the word with the love. Like, agape means to love. Yeah. Another Greek dictionary defined agape as to take pleasure in, to regard with a high value. So, so remember, this passage says that God revealed his love for us by coming to us on that Christmas day. And so that, you know, this means that he loved us before he came. In fact, love is what compelled him to come. So it's a simple point, but I want you to know, God loved us before he came. Okay, and and the love we just saw here means to regard with high value to regard with worthiness, right? To, when you, the agape means to regard someone as high value and worthiness. So that means God had high value for you. God has, God sees you worthy of him coming. Even before he came. You know, sometimes we, we, you know, we, we teach that we're all sinners. And that's true. We are all sinners. And so, so sometimes we, you know, and this is an area that I've been meditating on a lot these days. Sometimes we mistake in that idea of sin with a sense of worthiness, of worthlessness. You know, we think, well, we're a sinner, so we're worthless. Um, you know, we deserve to go to hell, or we're trash, or we're nothing but a dirty rag. You know, um, I remember my dad. 
um, who passed, I remember him praying and saying, thank you for saving us who are like worthless bugs. It's prayed in Korean and I was trying to translate it. It's like worthless bugs. And, and I, I think the doctrine of total depravity contributed to this view that we're totally depraved and there's no good in us whatsoever. And, and some of us grow up being pounded with this idea that you don't deserve love. You're, no, you're of no value because of your sins. And it's not just Christians, you know. Um, we often, you know, whether we're Christians or not, we often grow up with this um, sense of worthlessness. I'm, I'm nothing. I'm no good, you know. And we, we live with this sense of worthlessness. You know, I was watching a um, comedy uh, special at Netflix by this guy named Neil Brennan. Brennan? How many of you have heard of him? Anyway, he's up and coming, <laughs> I think. But he's really good. There, it's on Netflix. Um, I saw him on um, Noah Trevor, uh, the final show, and uh, he was being interviewed. And I thought, oh, they talked about his comedy special. So it's Noah Trevor says it's good. So I, I figure, you know, because I love Noah Trevor's um, comedy. So I, Grace and I saw it, and it was absolutely an amazing comedy show. He called it a traumedy, kind of comedy of his trauma. <laughs> and, um, but he talked about, you know, struggling with this sense of worthlessness all his life. And it's kind of interesting to build a comedy show based on that kind of, that level of vulnerability, but check it out. But the point I'm trying to make is that whether we're Christians or not, we grow up with that sense. We struggle with it. But here, it says God loved us. God valued us. God finds you worthy before he came. Right? In fact, it's, it's this love that compel him to come. And, 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 and it's clear from the beginning that God created you and me, everyone, in the image of God. In Imago Dei, we are created. Therefore, all of us are worthy. All of us deserve to be loved. All of us are of high value. And let me be clear. Just because you sinned, just because you made mistakes, just because you hurt someone, or just because someone hurt you, doesn't mean your value and worth has declined. Do you understand that? Your sin doesn't make your worth any less than it is. You are beautifully created, and that's how God looks at you. You know, recently, um, actually, Michael Rorella um, recently recommended a book by Rachel, Rachel Held Evans uh, and Jeff Chu called uh, Wholehearted Faith. It's a great book, by the way. You should check it out. And in it is a poem written by Daniel Ledinsky. And he draws, um, he uses the word of St. Francis of Assisi in this poem. And this is a poem. I think God might be a little prejudiced. For once, he asked me to join him on a walk through this world. And we gaze into every heart on this earth. And I noticed he'd linger a bit longer before any face that was weeping. And before any eyes that were laughing. And sometimes, when we pass the soul in worship, God, too, would kneel down. I have come to learn... God adores his creation. God adores his creation. Rachel Held Evans um, wrote about how this poem has impacted her life. She said this. She said, God adores his creation. The beauty of that image, the scandal of it, caught my breath. I slammed the book shut and wiped away a, a rush of sudden hot tears. These words seem dangerous, heretical even. They seem too good to be true, and yet 
Did they not call to mind the poetry of the prophets who spoke to Israel of a God who will exult over you with loud singing, who has called you by name, who has loved you with an everlasting joy? Did they not sound like the God of Hebrew scripture who soar over creation in the beginning and declare every flower and fish and tree and human in it good? Did they not echo the letters of saint? who proclaim that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God? Did they, did they not sound like Jesus, who through the smooth laminate of my Awana workbook first told me that God so loved the world? Amen. It's really good, huh? See, God values you. God finds you so worthy that he came down from heaven to be with you. I I think, you know, heaven is a a better neighborhood than downtown L.A. Went from over there to over here to be with you. He went all in on you. God sees you. Where you are, as you are, you're not a worthless bug. You have God's image in you. This is so important as to how you should see yourself. You know, sometimes we think our sins diminish our worth. Our sins are a problem, definitely. Our mistakes are a problem, but they do not diminish our values. We are a jewel in God's sight for whom God went all in on that Christmas day. We are jewels in God's eyes. We are a pearl of great value in God's eyes. And because we're all kind of Messy and dirty and hidden in dirt doesn't make that jewel or pearl any less valuable. Remember the parable of the hidden treasures? This is one of the parables that Jesus told. It's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has, and buys the field. You know, I, I think we have to read this passage, this parable, from, a, from two different perspectives. One, from God's perspective. And two, from our perspective. From our perspective, this is a call to go all in on God, loving God, and the kingdom of God, right? Go all in. This is a great treasure. But from God's perspective... It tells us that God sees us as jewels, and he went all in on you. Remember, we read 1 John 4, 10, the passage that we read earlier. He said, in this is love, and that not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. He said, well, it's not just about us loving God. It's just that it's about God loving us. And if he's calling us to go all in on the treasures of the kingdom of God, all in on loving God, isn't he saying, I'm going all in on you as well? It's not just about us loving God. It's about God loving us, right? You are a treasure. God's gone all in on you. You are a hidden treasure that God came to buy with his life. You are a jewel. And remember, right after that parable, he told another parable, the parable of the pearl of great value. In verse 45, it says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Basically, the same idea here is repetition. Of course, the kingdom of God and Jesus is the pearl of great value. 
But again, you need to know that this is how God thinks of you. You, from God's perspective, are the pearl of great value. Receive that. You are the pearl of great value. He finds you worthy, and he went all in on you. Of course, the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross justified us from our sins. But even before we believed, even before we were redeemed, even before, you know, even when we're in our sins, even when we were down and out, even when we were rebelling against God, even when we were going and saying, I don't care, I'm going my own way, just walking away from God. God saw each one of us. God saw you and saw a person of great value, saw a treasure, saw a pearl of great value. That's what it means that God loves us. God agapes us. He finds you worthy. He finds you valuable. Don't let your in-talk, self-talk, take you away from the reality and truth that God loves you and finds you worthy. I want us to take a moment of silence just to let this marinate into our heart and allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. God finds you worthy. God values you. Holy Spirit, continue to speak to us of your love. Second point about God's love, about agape. Remember the definition of agape? It also means to regard with affection, to take pleasure in. God wants to be with you. He has affection for you. He wants to take pleasure in you and fellowship with you. God takes joy in you. I love the song that we sang today. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I get it's the new version. Remember remember the old version? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Remember that? But it never actually struck me that we're not, you know, it's not asking us to produce joy. It's asking us to know that God is joyful in you. Right? Joy of the Lord. Not my joy. Joy of the Lord. The joy that God has for you is your strength. When you know that God is, God takes joy in you. But you say, but yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm like this. I'm, I'm you know, I, I made these mistakes. I'm, you know, I'm screwed up like this. And then God takes joy in you. Doesn't matter where you are. God wants to be with you. You know, sometimes we think God is constantly mad at us, you know? And we think that he's punishing us when we're actually punishing ourselves by making wrong decisions. Or maybe, you know, somebody else is punishing us or somebody else has made some mistakes that impacted us. It's not God who is doing this to you. God is not mad at you. God is not this disgruntled Santa Claus who says, no, 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 not this Christmas. That's that's not God. God loves you. God takes joy in you. He wants to be with you. He wants to connect with you deeply and intimately. He wants to fill you with his love. He wants to redeem you. 
and heal you and save you from all that is wrong, all that is hurtful, all that is difficult, all that is so hard in your life. God wants to save you. You know, some of us grew up with parents who who weren't there, some of them. Or maybe they didn't take pleasure in us because we just didn't measure up to their expectations. Or we just felt this sense there were constant disappointment to them. And some of us have been told really hurtful things like, you won't amount too much. You know, you're no good. You, you're not worth anything. And that's really a, a terrible burden to grow up with. On the top of that, some of us also grow up in this sense that God doesn't really like us. But then he came to rescue us because he is this self-sacrificial God. So we have this view that God does some great things, but he doesn't actually take pleasure in us. He doesn't actually like us. It's just like this cold, self-sacrificial love, God. I want you to know that God desires to be with you. God takes pleasure in you. Your presence is desire. You are wanted. God wants to be with you. God delights in you. And God wants you to join him in this feast of delight with you. Let's take a moment now just to pause and meditate on the reality that God delights in you. God takes pleasure in you and God wants to be with you. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Holy Spirit, continue to speak to us, O Lord, of your love. Third point, that God wants us to share that love for one another, to love one another. Remember we said that to love means to treat someone with worth and and value. And, and, And if that's how God loves us, that's, you know, We're called to do the same. To love one another means to treat one another with dignity, honor, worth, and value. Do you see that? It's not like, oh, that that guy is a, you know, this, but oh, God says to love her or him. And then you go, oh, okay. Well, you know, sometimes that happens because, you know, we, we have to get away. We, we, we have to fight through this, this thing that we're struggling with. But to love the way God loves us, to begin to see the value of that person, that they deserve to be loved, that they're worthy of love. It's important for us to see that, not only for ourselves, before other people as well. You are of great value. You are created in the image of God. God went all in on you. God values every human being. You know, this is the foundation of human rights in the world. You know, why why would any human being have human dignity and value unless God said they are of dignity and value? And that's how we came to see the foundation of human rights. God loves everyone. 
regardless of their background, regardless of their race, socioeconomic, sexual orientation, sexual identity, anything else, God loves everyone. Do you understand this? Not just you, God loves everyone. God values everyone. Even your enemies, God values. Even, even people who have hurt you, God values. That's hard to take. Like, God's on my side. God should hate that guy. No, God values everyone. Remember, that's why Jesus said, love your enemies. Why? Because God values your enemies. That's why it's important to, to engage and listen to the backstories of your enemies. Sometimes you find out that they're human. <laughs> To love is to see them with dignity and value, even if they hurt you. And I know that's sometimes extremely hard to do if they've been abusive to you and all of that. And you just want to create a monster in your head and just walk away from them. But that monster is also someone that God loves. Doesn't mean you should put yourself and get hurt over and over again by someone who abuses you. No, no, no. That's not what it means sometimes. You, you have to draw your boundaries and protect yourself. But at the end of the game, you have to acknowledge that whoever that person is, is also a human being that God loves. And that's hard to do sometimes, I know. It's hard to do. But this fundamental idea of human dignity regardless of their sins, regardless of their mistake, is, is foundational to God's love for the world. Instead, we, we Christians especially, we like to just create categories of people that we hate or categories of people that God hates. Not true. God, for God so loved the world. It's hard to, hard, to, hard to process. God sees value and worth even if they're in sin, even if they're hurting others, even if they're lost in addiction, even if they ripped you off, even if they disrespected you, even if they're your enemies. Do you see that? Unless we see their humanity and worth, it would be difficult to love them. God saw it in us, and God sees it in them. It could be hidden. It could be buried. But God can see it. It's often very difficult for us to see. God can see the pearl. God can see the treasure, not only in you, but in others as well. God can see with his eyes. Can you see it with God's eyes? You know, one of my favorite songs a long time ago is uh, by Amy Grant. Um, she sang a song called My Father's Eyes. It goes like this. I may not be every mother's dream for her little girl, and my face may not grace the mind of everyone in the world, but that's all right as long as I can have one wish, I pray. When people look inside my life, I want to hear them say, she's got her father's eyes, her father's eyes, eyes that find the good in things when good is not around, eyes that find the source of help when help just can't be found, eyes full of compassion, seeing every pain, knowing what you're going through and feeling it the same, just like my father's eyes, my father's eyes, my father's eyes, just like my father's eyes. To love is to see people the way God sees people. Father's eyes. Always remember, how did God see that person? How can I see with my father's eyes? Because God's eyes of love, God's love, is bigger, wider, deeper, higher than anything we could imagine. That means our sense of respect and value and love towards our siblings 
must go beyond the conventions of our mind and of the world. I want to ask you to just take a moment to pause now. What does it mean for you to love someone? How can you love? How can you see with the Father's eyes? Or you can just ask God, help me to see. Allow the Spirit of God to speak to you for a moment. Let me pause now. Holy Spirit, speak to us, O Lord. God loves you. That's the good news of Christmas. He values you. He takes pleasure in you. And he wants you to dwell in him, to abide in him, and to love one another. I want to end by saying this one last thing. That God also sees your pain. He sees what's going on in your life. He sees your tears, sees your struggles. He wants to give you his love for you. He wants to hug you and say that he loves you. He loves you. I know that our hearts could be hardened. All that has happened. Holy Spirit, soften our hearts. Help us to receive your love. Help us to know that you see me. You see us. That you see us. That even before anything started, even before our redemption, even before our repentance, even before we turn away from whatever, even before we made things right, even when things were not right in our lives, you love us. That your love for us is unconditional. Help us to see this love, O oh Lord. Lord, you and, and, and this God came not only to see your pain, but also experience, empathize. And to live the life that you live. To identify with you because he wants to be with you. He's not a God who's far away out there, creator of the universe. Big guy who doesn't care for you and your little life. Our little life that we live in. He came down into this little life. And the good news of Christmas is that God loves you. He wants to be with you. He empathizes with you. He knows what you're going through. He knows your pain. He knows the pain of poverty. He was born into poverty. He knows the pain of being an immigrant. Jesus was an immigrant to Egypt because of persecution. He knows the pain of, pain of being treated unjustly. He knows the pain of death. God sees you and came to see you even more closely by taking on human flesh. God loves you. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the good news that you declare, not because of anything we did, but just because you see us 
worthy enough to give up everything for, to come down to be with us. So, Lord, we see your love. We see your delight. We see your joy. And that joy, let us experience your joy this Christmas, oh, Lord. So that our hearts will begin to melt and begin to sing of the strength that comes from your joy, experiencing your joy, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.